Good afternoon, uh, evening everyone. My name is Timothy Long, Curator of Fashion and Decorative Arts at the Museum of London. I've worked at the museum now for about a year and a half um, within the Fashion and Decorative Arts collection. Uh, prior to that, I was Curator of Fashion and Decorative Arts at the Chicago History Museum, hence the accent. And so I worked there for nearly 15 years, um, working within the Historic Dress and Textile Collection. And so it's been a great pleasure now to uh, move to London, a big change. Um, I came here to work specifically with the Museum of London's collection, specifically their menswear archive. Uh, menswear is my passion. It is something that I have studied now um, for most of my adult life. And the Museum of London has one of the most remarkable collections of historic menswear in the world. You may not know that, um, and that is for various reasons. Um, I don't think the museum has given enough um, time and effort to the menswear archive. So hopefully you'll start seeing more and more things. We have recently opened a couple of small exhibitions on menswear. Um, I feel that the museum is giving me a little bit of playroom to see if what I'm saying actually um, holds water, if people will really come and see menswear. I don't know if you have been keeping your eye on some of the facts and figures that are coming out of the menswear industry here in London, but they forecast that by the year 2016, more men's clothing will be sold in London than women's clothing. And so, and that is the trajectory that we are currently on. So if we stay with the sales that we're currently um, having within London, more men's clothing will be sold um, in London than women's clothing. And so due to that, you might also um, have seen that we have now a separate women's fashion week and a separate men's fashion week. And so it's the glitz and glamorous fashion shows um, coming to and fro, some in Somerset House, some sprinkled around the city. But Men's Fashion Week used to be attached on to the end of Women's Fashion Week. And so by the time all of the journalists were going on to other cities, then men's fashion shows began. And so they were almost completely forgotten. And so due to the increase um, if, of interest in um, menswear, um, there is now a separate Men's Fashion Week. And due to more money being sold eventually, um, more money being put to men's fashion than women's fashion, there's a great deal of interest in making sure that the men's industry is supported. And so there are various um, offshoots of the Men's Fashion Week that I have thankfully been able to be a part of. I was in Istanbul recently promoting the men's fashion industry in the United Kingdom, and some of the things that we're doing to support men's fashion. So for example, New Gen Men is a competition for the new generation of menswear designers. And so each year, these menswear, a selection of menswear designers are selected to receive both financial support as well as legal advice and support that governs over how to pick certain textiles, where to get those textiles made, how to have patterns cut, import, export, retail issues, and so really making sure that the industry, the, the young generation in the industry is supported to go on to become companies like Burberry, of course, which are very much connected to uh, England. And so it is a great time to have come to London to support men's fashion, um, but then also to try and think creatively about how the Museum of London's archive can be used to help support an, an initiative that is starting to promote London as the capital of menswear. <clears throat> when I was first pulled into the committee, which is made up of various menswear um, professionals, if you will, from designers, pattern cutters, people who work at uh, major magazines, so the head of GQ, people who buy menswear, Liberties, other stores, Top Man, for example. There's a round table of individuals that have now been meeting for over a year. And the first meeting that they had was uh, to discuss the sort of opening of how to respond to this great interest that the public has in menswear. At that meeting, they realized they didn't have a historian on the committee. And if you see any menswear designers in London, they often closely connect their, their uh, design style to heritage. It's something that you'll commonly find in many of the labels here in London and the United Kingdom, where using an element of history to promote their brand. Uh, using elements of men's history in London specifically. So the heritage component within 
the menswear campaign is very strong. And so I was brought in um, as a menswear historian, fashion historian, to try and provide some of the facts and figures related to things that they wanted to do. So for example, one of the first things I heard was that they wanted to cover all of the buses in London with a statement that said London is the capital of menswear. And I raised my hand, are we the capital of menswear? Can we actually say that we are the capital? Have you done your research? Of course, there's no academics at the table. And so trying to get them to maybe pause a bit and to try and think creatively about how heritage can influence and promote the contemporary menswear market. And so over this last year, holding off on covering the buses with various statements, we have launched a new research project um, at the Museum of London, probably about two to five years. Academics would like five years. Those in the communications department want me to deliver, deliver next year, basically. So we're uh, bringing it down to probably a, about a two to five year program. And so what we're doing is starting to review all of the things that London has promoted and given birth to related to menswear. The bowler hat is of course something that uh, was born here in London, but a whole long list of things that have been born in London and the United Kingdom that have gone, gone on to become global uh, trends. And so what we're doing is trying to repackage some of those stories in a very 21st century way. And I'll show some of that in the presentation today, but presenting it to a contemporary audience in a way that we can all speak about with authority. So for example, are we the, um, the capital? And so we're starting to not only look at the history of this city, going into great detail about all of the different elements of menswear, but also starting to compare it to other cities. So in order to say London is the capital, and I believe it has been the capital now for almost 500 years in menswear, we're starting to also branch out. We're doing some research um, in various collections around the globe that have menswear archives to try and see specifically where certain techniques, where certain trends were born. And so for example, I see many people, many men and women wearing jackets. There's a specific craft that goes into the construction of menswear, the bowler hat as well. There's a specific technique that was used to produce those specific items of dress. So the lapel on my collar is done with an element of called pad stitching, prick stitching, you'll often hear it. And what we're trying to do is pinpoint where specifically those techniques were born. Some people say, well, of course, they must have been born on Savile Row in the late 18th century, but the Savile Row tailors had taken a craft that was hundreds of years old by that point and then created Savile Row. So we're going back into the 16th, 15th, 14th century and actually looking at objects and letting the objects tell us when the history began. Because unfortunately, there's not a great deal of written record related to the production of clothing and textiles from the Middle Ages. There are some, but not the kind of information that we are most interested in getting. And so we're letting the objects tell us. And so looking within the archives to try and identify what artifacts might provide some clues as to where certain techniques were born. And so getting close into the items, looking at the, the way that they're um, constructed. But then unfortunately, a lot of these items, well, I should say fortunately, a lot of these items are in good condition. What that means is we can't get to the interior layers. That's why I said unfortunately. Um, and so being able to get to the interior layers of many of these items is absolutely key to understanding how they're constructed. And it's a craft that gave birth to many of these techniques. And so trying to figure out specifically and how a needle is put into thread, at what angle is it put into the fabric, and how you start to manipulate the three-dimensional body of a jacket, the three-dimensional body of a, a hat, various things that wrap around the human being. And so those are some of the techniques that we're looking into. And so when I received the request to potentially uh, present today on the bowler hat, I thought it fit perfectly into some of the research that we're doing because we are looking very closely at the bowler hat and its history and applying some really interesting uh, techniques to try and unveil some of the history of the bowler hat. The image here uh, we took many months ago um, for the uh, fashion shows, the London Collections Men Fashion Show, uh, many months ago, pardon. 
and fit perfectly, of course, for today. And so at first, I went through the collection, um, looking at all of the bowler hats many months ago, just to see object-based study, what might stand out. And at first, of course, uh, there are about 25 black bowler hats sitting on the table, near identical to each other. And I had that unfortunate panic moment. I thought, OK, well, maybe there's nothing really interesting to tell. It's a black bowler hat. We know pretty much straightforward what they look like. The history is pretty well uh, documented, although it can be controversial. Uh, there's a few different ideas of where the bowler hat came from. Um, but what we're starting to do is see if we can tease out something quite interesting from this story. And so this presentation is a little bit of the history, but then also some of the things that we're currently doing to try and unveil some of the interesting elements of the history of the bowler hat. And so the bowler hat, of course, is this specific shape. Um, it's called the bowler hat because of two gentlemen who were involved in the creation of the original shape who were hired by Lock and Company. They were the Bowler Brothers, two individuals who were hired by Lock and Company to create this specific hat. So Lock and Company, the oldest milliner here in the city of London, is the company that gave birth to this specific hat in 1849. Now, this is the story that starts to get a little unclear because there are other companies, unfortunately, that claim ownership to this uh, origin of this hat. But Lock and Company stands firm in that they uh, were the origins. There's very clear documentation connected to William Coke, uh, Cook, pardon. It's spelled Coke, but pronounced Cook, who was the gentleman who originally ordered the hat. And so the reason <clears throat> he originally ordered the hat is he lived in Norfolk, and he had a tremendous amount of land. And at the time, he employed uh, quite a few gamekeepers, um, something that um, they still exist, but not as much as they certainly did in the 19th century. And so if you had a lot of land, uh, forgive me if everyone already knows this, but just to make sure we all know what a gamekeeper is, um, they tended to, of course, the game on the uh, land that was owned by William Cook. And so the gamekeepers were having some difficulty keeping themselves looking good because they were wearing top hats and then going about their business on their hats. They were running into the low-hanging branches, denting their top hat, their very expensive top hat, because, of course, William Cook wanted all of his staff to look really sharp. The top hat fell off. It got dented. That wouldn't work, so of course he sent those men back to order new hats, and then the price just continued to explode. So he was a shopper, um, a client of um, Lock and Company. And so he went to Lock and Company and said, I'm having this issue with my gamekeepers and continuously spending a lot of money to try and keep their hats looking crisp and clean. And so he said, is there a way that you could create a hat for me that A, will protect their heads, B, will stay on their heads, um, and then withstand any kind of um, blunt force that might hit their heads. And so the bowler hat was invented as a form of protective headwear. It was a work uh, helmet, basically, that went on to become what we know it is today. And so uh, we found some interesting tidbits <clears throat> related to the history, but what I thought perhaps just to make sure everyone understands what the bowler hat is, it's quite obvious, but just to make sure we're on the same page, there are a variety of men's hat shapes. Uh, there are something about 48 different hat shapes that a proper man in the late 19th century could have purchased. The bowler hat itself, there's about 13 different variations of the bowler hat, and you can leave it up to a fashion historian to know all that. We don't need to go into all of those juicy details, but there are a great deal of variations. But more than not, it's a dome-shaped hat with a small brim with a slight upturn, and it's most often made out of black wool felt. And that's a very key component um, to the shape of the hat. And so in order to fully understand how it's made, there are these two images. And if you have never uh, understood millinery, basically wool felt is an unwoven textile. Um, I often compare it to a dryer sheet, um, a chicken McNugget, a Pringle chip. Basically, you take a product, chew it up, press it back together into a new shape, and that's what felt is. Felt is in sheets, so if you pull felt strong enough, it'll eventually pull apart. Unlike a textile that's woven on a loom, that's not going to pull apart. 
And because it is an unwoven structure, if you apply heat and moisture and brute force, you can stretch a flat piece of felt over the wooden hat block, which is specifically cut to the shape of the interior of what you want. So this is a pretty standard shape, but perhaps you might remember or think of Philip Tracy's hats. These wild, outrageous creations are all shaped over a mold, and those molds are called hat blocks. It's often made out of uh, various types of wood. Typically, wood is a bit too hard, so they're made out of various forms of cork because you want to be able to stick pins into it. So once you've stretched the wool felt over the hat, you need to keep it in that position to allow it to dry and cool. So you stick pins around. If you looked closely at this one around the, the crown where it meets the brim, you'd see all these small little holes. You stick those holes or pins in, let it dry. Once it's dry, you take the uh, block out and it retains that shape. What William Cook did was he then, uh, I'm sorry, what Lock and Company did was they then impregnated the felt with a very solid um, animal fat. And that animal fat was a type of um, glue. And so it's an unknown exact um, recipe that he used, still unknown to this day. It's a trade secret. And so basically, William Cook came to um, pick up the hat to test it, supposedly, as the story goes, threw it on the ground and jumped on top of it a couple of times to see if it would withstand. It supposedly did, and he paid 12 shillings for the hat, and there you have the birth of the bowler. And so this is the type of mount that um, individuals might use to create a bowler hat. If you've ever had the pleasure of going to Lock and Company and seeing a behind-the-scenes tour, you'll see that they make it very differently. This is a very one-off style of bowler hat mount, something that is for the type of product, the amount that they create at Lock & Company. It's a much more um, industrialized process. Big machines, a lot of heat, and a, a bit more involved than the bowler hat mount that we have here. <clears throat> Felt can be shaped into a wild variety. You can basically shape it to any shape. And so these are various images from the Museum of London Archives, showing hats that date back to uh, the mid-17th century, all the way up to a bowler hat that was created within just the last few years um, on the bottom right with the flag. These are all non-woven hats that were all shaped over a block. And if you ever think uh, or ever heard of um, Mad as a Hatter, the reason that term comes about is because of the mercury that they use in order to process the felt. And we won't get into the details of that because that is an, another lecture uh, on its own is all of the poisons that go into dress. It's something we deal with all the time. We've tested all of our hats because mercury was used, arsenic was used, and the mercury, of course, is a poison. And if you continue to inhale the mercury fumes that you must put into the hair, fo hair follicle uh, of the animal that's used for felt, if you continue to inhale mercury fumes, obviously uh, it will not be good for your health. And so the hatter started to go crazy. And so uh, there's a lot of myth around that, but truly the mercury process in the production and the processing of the felt is where that matter as a hatter um, idea comes from because it is the chemical that takes the hair follicle. And if you look at the hair follicle under a microscope, it's got little flakes coming off of it. Once you start to um, put that fiber into a bath of chemicals, it starts to open those flakes, and then eventually, by rubbing them together, is what produces the felt textile. So over a mount, um, you can see on the top left, we have a woman's uh, mid-1920s hat, 1970s hat worn by Sebastian Horsley, medieval cap, woman's cap uh, on the top right, Second World War, um, 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 there's a specific name for them, civilian clothing, uh, so issued by the government, a uh, specific style of clothing that was created throughout the Second World War. Uh, tricorn hat in the center that has been embellished with a feather um, trim. Unfortunately, the feather is almost completely gone. It was eaten prior to coming to the museum. And then a bowler hat uh, in the shape of the flag. And so all of these were created over the form, even the ones in the Middle Ages, and then uh, eventually allowed to dry. You can see on the top right, though, there is a 
uh, softening of certain hair follicles, which is really quite interesting. If you look at some paintings in the Middle Ages, 16th, 16th and 17th century, if you created a bowler hat or a hat, sorry, bowlers weren't created then, out of felt, and it was not out of beaver felt, it would start to sag with the heat coming off of your head and the moisture coming off of your head. And so sagging hats were a way to identify people who could not afford beaver. And so if you ever look at paintings and you see people with sagging hats and then people with erect hats, that is a clear delineation of the economic status of the people that are represented. And it would be a very clear way of knowing who had created a hat out of potentially horse, uh, any animal that has a hair, uh, hair follicle, you can, or, or hair, you can use that hair to create felt. But beaver felt is the best that keeps its shape with heat and moisture. That's why beaver was wiped out in this country until not too long ago. It was completely made extinct. And then once uh, North American continent was discovered, they realized it wasn't China. Um, but then they see a bunch of beaver running around. And that is what fueled uh, the exploration of the North, <clears throat> North American continent was finally finding beaver at, after it had been uh, made extinct uh, in this country. But it was brought back in not too many years back. So it has returned. And so the bowler hat comes out of a vari uh, various types of felt hats, hats that were very popular in the mid-19th century. Heath was a very popular company that produced hats not too far from here, and they produced a wild variety of hats for both men and women. And we recently found a catalog um, on eBay and uh, bought it for the collection. And within it, uh, we see a wild variety of the hats that they produced, showing you on the left the various uh, variations of the bowler hat. Some were tall, some were uh, a little bit more rounded, a little bit more square. And all of these conform to what is often called the language of hats. We do not know it anymore, but people in the 19th century would have understood pretty much all of the different variations of the hats. And what we're playing with right now is um, this language of hats related to Sherlock Holmes. The next exhibition that the Museum of London will open in October is on Sherlock Holmes, and I am working heavily on that exhibition to add dress to the exhibition. And bowler hats are very much a part of our research because bowler hat, I bowler hat, both Sherlock and Dr. Watson are rendered in um, in the Paget drawings and were used a great uh, in many stories to provide a slight variation between Sherlock and Holmes. So we're looking into the history of the bowler hat for Sherlock, but then also for the general menswear project. This is an image that just shows you a bit of the gamekeeper, um, that they actually wore the bowler hats, and so much very connected to the gameskeeper. And so here you have an image of a gameskeeper and the gameskeeper's daughter. Uh, showing you just the sort of ro romantic angle of uh, the gameskeeper. This one obviously is not on a horse. By the 1890s, it had already become very popular um, for uh, formal wear. And so with having been invented in 1849, it was first considered working uh, dress. But then by the mid to late 19th, by the late 19th century, it had become quite popular for both formal and high formal clothing as well. And here, uh, a great image, again from that same catalog, shows you the um, problems that sometimes come about with riding a horse and your hat falling off. And so you can see on the far left, you've got the cord coming off of the back of the hat, because this was a great problem to the gamekeepers as well, is that they would be riding about, um, or men on the hunt, various types of activities related to hunting and hunting parties. If you're wanting to make sure you look properly dressed, and your hat falls off. You don't want to go back and get it. It'll be ruined once it falls off the height that you're on of the horse. And so these cords were connected to the hat. You can see a gentleman on the far right there also falling off. And so in this uh, image, we're going to be using this in the Sherlock Holmes exhibition because there's an object coming up that's uh, been a, a really interesting um, research project for us. And so 
When I mentioned earlier that we pulled out all of the bowler hats within the archive, um, and I'm very much an object-based historian, uh, I always like to make sure I go off of the object first, then apply the theory. And this is the one hat that stood out as unique. There were about 40 to 45 hats that we have in our collection. Many are variations of black. Uh, some are taller, some are shorter. But this one stood out as unique. It's gray. So that in itself um, means it's unique compared to all of the others in the collection. Not saying that gray is unique generally, but doing the research within the museum's archive, this one hat stood out. It was the tallest of all of them. But then also, as you can see here, there are two black grommets stuck into the side of the hat. And so if you think about that, if you pretend you're Sherlock, as we've been doing, if you come upon this hat, perhaps at a crime scene, what are the clues that you're going to use to try and better understand its story? And unfortunately, within the museum archive, um, especially some of the items that were donated decades ago, the type of cataloging that you might want, it unfortunately doesn't exist. So the catalog record says bowler hat. That's it. Not even a color. The cord is not listed. The metal grommets are not listed. So there would be no way of finding the uniqueness of this through the record. So it's only by looking at the actual artifact. And so the two grommets in the side of the hat are, of course, if you think about it, for ventilation. So that would suggest the wearer was doing some type of physical activity where they needed some air exchange in their, up on top of their head. And then the cord coming off, we find that cord before I found the image that I just showed you. And so here we have a bowler hat accessioned and cataloged as only a bowler hat, and none of these other bits are connected to it. And so it started to seem like we had something unique. And so we did a little bit uh, closer of inspection, finding various elements that were giving us a little bit uh, more of a clue. But then, just recently, thankfully, my department was able to afford dino lights, which have changed my way of looking at historic dress. Dino lights, unfortunately, are quite expensive, at least the magnification. It's a microscope that's connected to your USB port. And that's something within the science community, they've been around for a little while, but within the museum community, it's something quite new for us. And because um, they are about 800 pounds, it took a little um, convincing that we needed to have this, but thankfully we finally got it. And so down in the storeroom, without needing a scientist, without needing conservators, I took out the dino light and started to look at the hat. And because I had seen a little white dusting around the brim, I thought, well, this is peculiar. Stuck the dino light on it, and sure enough, there are small white feathers all over the top of the bowler hat. And so this is some of the play that we're using right now for the Sherlock Holmes story. And so to include dress in the exhibition, you might naturally think the deerstalker. To me, that's a bit boring. That's not the type of exhibition that the Museum of London wants to produce. So instead of just throwing a deerstalker as uh, the only <coughs> dress in the Sherlock uh, Holmes exhibition, we're starting to look at some of the dress items like this. So for example, how would Sherlock look at one of these items? And being able to look at some of the hair, it, you can't even see that it's hairy, just see little white bits. But looking at it closely and seeing hair, I'm sorry, seeing uh, feathers, we've <coughs> since analyzed them, and they are indeed goose feathers. We're trying to identify through the isotope level where the uh, geese, the goose has come from. And that's also something that can be done. And it's at, we're on the cusp of looking at uh, plant and animal fiber to try and identify the country of origin. And this is all how we can better understand the item. So for example, it's made of wool. Is it British wool or is it potentially a different type of wool? And where specifically, where um, was this man hunting? So we have a bowler hat here that's cataloged as a bowler hat, but by adding all of these other interesting tidbits, we might possibly have a bowler hat that's very much connected to the original story of how it came about, which is a gamekeeper. A man, or a woman, because we're woman gamekeepers. So you have a hat that's gray. Typically, gray is associated to the staff working uh, with um, a farm. 
So the man who owns the farm would have a black hat, his staff would have gray. So that there connects with the history of the color usage. Then you've got the grommets in the si side suggesting there's some physical activity, so he is keeping the game, potentially. The cord on the back, so he doesn't have to go back and get uh, the hat. But then, not a few feathers, but hundreds of feathers. And so if you think of actually killing a goose, Sometimes we are thought maybe he just stuck a feather in the cap, but here it actually appears that the goose was killed very close to the man wearing the hat because so many feathers have fallen onto the hat. And so these are the type of ways we're trying to think of allowing technology to help tell the story, but package it in a, a fresh new way. <clears throat> I also took uh, some time and um, went through the archive to see what kind of images we could find to show a little bit of the trajectory of the different types of bowler hats that were worn. And this is an Im image uh, taken on Cheapside um, in 1877, around 1877. And this is the um, bad fish seller. So after the fish was used for, um, the good fish was used, I guess, this is the stuff that's left over. And so it's one of the many uh, carts that would have been seen around the area we're in now. And you can see here that there's a variety of hats. The seller has got a very tall hat, very tall bowler. The others are a little less tall. There's a top hat in the background. So just showing that it was definitely something that was very commonplace by the mid-19th century, or about by the 1870s. And then here's um, referring back to uh, SP for Sidney Paget, who did the illustrations the original illustrations that you would have seen if you were reading the Sherlock stories in the Strand magazine in the late 19th century, written, of course, by Conan Doyle. And so we have been, I have been looking at all of the illustrations related to Sherlock Holmes because we will be having uh, a great deal of clothing in the exhibition. We're going to be dressing a Sherlock and a Holmes from the late 19th century. And often you'll see them wearing bowler hats. But then if you take a bowler hat out today, and show it to a contemporary audience, there's everything that has happened since then. So the clockwork orange men, of course, always wearing bowler hats, the various iterations of Sherlock Holmes throughout the 20th century. And often, when I show it to a contemporary audience, if I have the Sherlock and Watson mannequins here in front of you, many people say, oh, they look like bankers. They don't think Sherlock um, Holmes or Dr. Watson. So we're having a little bit of a struggle to try and figure out how specifically to have two dressed mannequins in late 19th century dress look exactly like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And unfortunately, the bowler hat doesn't seem to be standing out as the one most representative of Sherlock um, uh, Holmes and Watson top hats. As soon as we change it from a bowler hat and those exact same mannequins, but dress them with top hats, people immediately say uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. So unfortunately, in this instance, we don't think we'll have the bowler hat. Um, we still will have a bowler hat, many bowler hats in the exhibition. And that gray one that I just showed you, we will have that entire setup in the exhibition. Because many other hats, we've also done x-rays of them. Uh, because sometimes they're laden with mercury. And you actually can see the mercury fluoresce in the uh, top hat. Uh, so much mercury, uh, it's, an, it's very poisonous, but you'd have to eat the hat in order to uh, be sick. So thankfully, I don't think that will be a problem. Um, and then you have, uh, like I mentioned earlier, some of the variations that come about in the 20th century related to the top hat. By the mid part of the 20th century, you have um, the post-Second World War changes happening, various uh, groups starting to play with fashion in a way that hadn't happened prior to the war. And so here you have sort of the two worlds. You have the gentleman walking through, perhaps a banker, someone working in the financial district, but then you have the youth culture who is starting the mods, the rockers, playing with a dress and subverting some of the um, codes that were so strong in the early part of the 20th century. And that's when you start to see people um, various performers starting to wear a top hat, so playing with some of the meaning and presenting it to a 21st century audience. Interestingly enough, you have bowler hats that are, of course, worn around the world. Of course, in the United States, you see them in the early part of the 20th century, at, um, as you did here, being worn by respectable gentlemen. Um, but in the 1920s, in South America, you have the railway, railways that was expanding into South America. 
And because the United Kingdom had had such a successful run with the railway industry here, many British workers were brought over to South America to help create the railway system of South America. And because the railway workers were wearing bowler hats, they bring the trend from England, from the United Kingdom to South America. And strangely enough, it's picked up by women. Men wore, wore it as well. But if you go to various places in South America, Bolivia, um, you'll find women wearing this as a traditional part of their dress. And they call it a traditional part of their dress, even though it came, about, came to them only in about 1915 through about 1925. And for a long time, for many decades, it was, uh, these hats were created in Italy, strangely enough, then sent to South America to be worn uh, by various communities in South America. But uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, thankfully, uh, many of these communities who were having some financial uh, issues, some of the Italian hat makers actually trained the local communities on how to make bowler hats using the exact same technique that Lock and Company had used uh, in 1849 to create the hat then. So the exact same technique, they even shared some of the uh, recipe of how to impregnate the hat with that very uh, strong resin in order, in order to create it stiff. The interesting slight change is that they're often made a little small, so they hit, sit very high on the head compared to what they were originally meant to do is sit very snug to the head so they wouldn't fall off. Even they say that um, the railway workers would determine a properly fitting bowler hat by sticking their head out of the train at full speed. And if it didn't fall off, you had a properly fitting uh, bowler hat. And so here it's sitting much higher on the, head and that's on the head, and that's very much the look. And often you'll find some color um, in the hats. Here you have a brown uh, felt that's trimmed with a brown leather but very, very typical look uh, for the women of South America who um, wore the bowler hats um, and still very much wear the bowler hats. Now, we have and continue to collect, of course, a great deal of dress at the Museum of London. And one of the most recently acquired collections was clothing that was worn at the Olympics, uh, both by athletes, so we accessioned Tom Daly's trunks, uh, Bradley Wiggins' jersey, um, but the bulk of the clothing that was brought in were worn at the opening and closing ceremonies of the, op of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, we acquired 94 different um, uniforms, ensembles, um, which was something like 650 individual parts, uh, which we're still cataloging. Um, but here you have two images. So Mary Poppins descending from the sky, of course, at the opening of the London 22 game, 2012 games. And then you have um, the punk heads. We played a little bit with the um, image here. That's actually a mannequin of Queen Victoria um, that we used in order to dress the punk head, having a little fun downstairs in the storeroom. Unfortunately, she is naked. She probably wouldn't be too happy, but... We have to uh, often create mannequins that are the exact size of the original wearer. And this is a dress that she wore. Or you don't see the dress, but we had to create the mannequin for her uh, for a dress she wore in 1899. And by that point, she had uh, grown a little bit. And so that's why um, the mannequin is that size. But having a little fun with the image uh, there. But then also, we have this bowler hat, which is um, the most recent thing that we acquired. The bowler hat, of course, because it's an icon, the same reason why it's being used for the festival here is the reason it's used, um, was used in the games. So these were um, officials that uh, were ushers uh, in a term that was generally used. They were called something else that I'm forgetting the name, but generally referred to as ushers, who assisted with um, moving people around during the um, opening of the games. And so it is a blue polyester, um, bowler, unfortunately not, uh, real wool, the jacket and then the shorts, which you can't see, but then there is a battery pack um, that goes along with the hat that illuminates um, the, the light bulb on the top. And so we acquired that. It's actually on exhibit. Uh, if you would like to see it, unfortunately not lit up. That's not <laughs> conservation friendly for us. 
um, but it is uh, the most recent acquisition to the collection. And also, um, we've recently started a relationship with Lock and & Company and trying to see if um, there are some origins uh, related to the original order from 1849, because there's a lot of myth about that original order. But again, in repackaging this story, we're hoping to work closely with Lock & Company to see if there might be anything from that original order. Do they have a receipt? Do they have any of the correspondence that might have existed between um, William Cook and uh, uh, Lock and Company at that time? So we're looking uh, to try and strengthen that relationship to see what might come out. But the bowler hat is just one of many things that the Museum of London will be repackaging uh, for a 21st century presentation of the things that have been created in menswear here in London. Thank you.